Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm taking the opportunity to introduce myself. My, I'm also Lorenius, and I work at the ENT Operation Ward at Karolinska Hospital in Solna. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Thrive and apneic oxygenation and how it can be used in the Operation Ward today. I'll give you a brief introduction to the subject, but mainly present two studies that we have conducted at our department. I have no conflicts of interests to declare. The background is that anesthesia complications related to the airway have diminished over the years. We have well-known data here from the ASA close claims analysis to the left in the picture, showing that the respiratory events as a cause of death and brain damage have diminished, decreased substantially since the mid-70s until now. Uh, but still, hypoxia remains a significant problem that can cause serious impact, dramatic impact to the outcome of our patients, as has been shown in NAP4, among other studies. To prevent hypoxia from occurring, the pre-oxygenation with 100% oxygen is standard practice when uh, inducing anesthesia. And we know that uh, we do this to denitrogenate the lungs and create a reserve of oxygen that can be utilized during apnea. Uh, still, we know that pre-oxygenation prolongs the time substantially to desaturation, but even so, some of our patients do experience desaturation during uh, anesthesia induction. So what can further be done to prevent hypoxia from, from occurring? Well, apneic oxygen can be used. Apneic oxygen has been evaluated in both animals and humans since the beginning of uh, the 20th century. It has been shown that oxygenation can be well kept for a considerable time, but the, the limit of its use is rather the increase of carbon dioxide and the lowering of pH, which eventually will uh, affect the circulation. And this was the case in the famous study of Frumin that was done in the mid-50s, where two of the healthy volunteers got malignant ar arrhythmias. Uh, in a couple of more recent studies, uh, apneic oxygenation has been tried delivering nasopharyngeal oxygen uh, to the patients during intubation. And this has been given in a rather low or moderate flow of oxygen between 3 and 15 liters per minute. And you could see in these studies that the saturation was well preserved for considerable time, up to 10 minutes in healthy, normal weight patients, uh, but it was also extended in the obese. As a further extension of this study, uh, of this technique, apneic oxygenation uh, using OptiFlow in a nasal cannula and a very high flow of oxygen, up to 70 liters per minute, was presented in a landmark study, uh, the THRIVE study, in 2015 by Patel and uh, Nore. Uh, in this study, apneic oxygenation using Thrive uh, was used when securing the airway in patients with a difficult airway. Uh, this was a case series of 25 patients. The patients were on Thrive oxygenation for a median time of 14 minutes, but the time varied between 5 minutes and 65 minutes. None of the patients desaturated below 90%, which was remarkable. The second remarkable finding of this study was the fact that the rise of carbon dioxide was slower than in older, previously done studies. The rise in, in the Thrive study, as you can see in the picture here, was 0.15 kilopascals per minute, which can be compared with older studies where it has been about 0.5 kilopascals per minute, as you're well familiar with. The CO2, that means uh, that you can extend the apneic period. This, the Thrive study that you see in the circle, uh, the rise of carbon dioxide in that, in that study was comparable to two studies shown on the side here, that one and that one, where oxygen was delivered directly in the trachea with a moderate or a very high flow. So there seems to be some sort of washout of carbon dioxide when using this technique with a very high flow. Although the mechanism for this isn't, isn't entirely clear. So the rationale for the study that we conducted uh, was the fact that 
use of Thrive is increasing. Octiflow is a well-known device within the intensive care where it has been used when weaning patients from the respirator or even as an alternative to, to the ventilator uh, to start with. And it's been used like that for more than a decade. It's also been used for post-operatively post when having extubated patients. The use in this way is in spontaneously breathing patients, which should be differed from the one thing that I'm talking about here. Apneic oxygenation is an, in an anesthetized and paralyzed patient using Optiflow had only been described in this first Thrive study in 2015 in these 25 patients. And it should be noted that measurement of carbon dioxide was done entirely, except in four patients that already had an arterial line. So it was measured before, uh, during spontaneous breathing, and at the end of apnea. So what we wanted to do was, uh, sorry, I should say that it, uh, our study was published in April this year, and it was also highlighted in an editorial in the same paper. The aim of our study was therefore to characterize the change of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide and the pH over time when using apneic oxygenation with Thrive in patients that had general anesthesia. We were very much inspired of our colleagues and friends from London that uh, encouraged us to do these studies. The method, uh, adult patients uh, with an ASA class of one to two that presented for elective surgery, laryngeal surgery of shorter duration were included in this study. They had general anesthesia with a target controlled infusion of propofol and remifentanil, and they had neuromuscular block induced with rocuronium. Pre-oxygenation and sole mode of ventilation in these anesthetized and paralyzed patients was, uh, was Thrive. To start with, 40 liters per minute, that increased to 70 liters per minute once anesthesia induction was done. Uh, we measured vital parameters and continuous measurement of peripheral oxygen saturation and transcutaneous carbon dioxide. And arterial blood sampling was done every five minutes. 30 patients with a mean age of 51 and a BMI of 25 were included in the study. It completed the protocol. The mean apnea time was 22.5 minutes. We found, and as you can see, this is a picture from the, from the operation theater, and you can see in the picture that the only mode of ventilation is the nasal cannula, and there's a surgeon that has put a laryngoscope in place, and there's no trace of respiration on the screen there. So that was the only mode of ventilation. We found that oxygenation using Thrive was well kept. In the left graph, you see that uh, mean SpO2 was never below 98% for, for the group as a whole, and no one desaturated below 91% during this time. In the right graph, you see the SpO2 at end of apnea for each individual, every dot, each dot re representing one individual. As for the rise of carbon dioxide, we could see that the arterial increase of carbon dioxide was 0.24 kilopascals per minute, which is lower than the traditionally made studies. And we also measured end tidal carbon dioxide uh, before at spontaneous uh, breathing and then at the end of apnea on the first breath they took. And we found that to be 0.12, the increase to be 0.12 kilopascals per minute. The top left graph is showing you the carbon dioxide level arterial uh, in, in the artery at the end for each individual each dot representing one individual. In the bottom left graph, you see that transcutaneous and arterial carbon dioxide correlated very well. We could see no difference between the two of them. And in the bottom right graph, you see the correlation of carbon dioxide and pH over time during apnea. The lowest pH in the study was 7.13. And if we plot our results in the original Thrive paper, this is what it looks like, where we measured end tidal carbon dioxide there, which correlates quite well with the Patel and Murray study, and the arterial measurement of carbon dioxide, the rise was 0.24 kilopascals per minute. Based on these findings, we can say that 
patients can safely be oxygenated with Thrive during anesthesia and when they are paralyzed, provided, of course, that they have an open airway at all times. That's crucial for the method to work. Uh, we do, uh, the lower rise in carbon dioxide makes it possible to extend the active take period for longer than before. And we recommend that monitoring of carbon dioxide should be done during apnea, and this can't be done with entitled measurement, of course. The editorial by Dr. McKenzie stated that optiflow flow has now found its place even in anesthesia, and that it can be used for shorter surgery, and, but also providing extra safety when managing a difficult airway. Safe oxygenation during apnea seems desirable if the apnea period is prolonged, and especially in rapid sequence induction when we avoid manual ventilation to our patients. This led us to the second study that I will present to you, and that was presented here uh, in a poster yesterday. Uh, in this study, we uh, did a randomized controlled trial comparing pre-oxygenation with either the tight occluding, occluding face mask or Thrive OptiFlow during pre-oxygenation. Uh, in patients presenting for emergency surgery where rapid sequence induction was indicated. This had not previously been done when we started the study, but we did find ourselves beaten in the race by our British colleagues, um, Fawzi Amir and co-workers, that presented this paper in March 2017 this year when we had just finished our data collection. Uh, there are some differences between our study though. The primary outcome in the MIR study was measurement of the partial pressure of our arterial oxygen. Uh, and there was no difference found between the two groups uh, in this study. Uh, and that was in spite of a longer total apnea time in the Thrive group, which was 4 minutes 13 seconds, to be compared with the face mask group, that where it was 2 minutes and 5 seconds. Nevertheless, Thrive was found not to be inferior to face mask when using it for pre-oxygenation, but a benefit could not be shown. So what we wanted to do, uh, the aims of our study, was to compare the lowest SpO2 uh, within one minute of intubation uh, when using either face mask or Thrive for pre-oxygenation. We also compared the number of patients that desaturated below a predefined level uh, of 93% during intubation, and we assessed occurrence of gastric regurgitation and patient discomfort in this study. 80 adult patients were included in the study. They were randomized to receive pre-oxygenation with either face mask or Thrive, and lowest SpO2 was measured within this first minute of intubation. Data from 79 patients of the 80 were was analyzed, and uh, we also found no differences in patient characteristics, type of surgery, or difficulty of intubation. Uh, there also was no difference in time of intubation or apnea time between the two groups in our study. As for primary outcome, in spite of an apparent difference in these groups, uh, there was no statistically significant difference in our primary outcome. Median SpO2 uh, during intubation was 99% in both groups, but with a range in the face mask group of 70 to 100%, and in the Thrive group, 96 to 100%. Although we did uh, no, see no difference in the primary outcome, we did see a difference in secondary outcome, that is the number of patients desaturating. Five out of 39 patients, that is 12.5% of the patients in the face mask group desaturated below 93%, whereas none in the Thrive group desaturated. There were no signs of gastric regurgitation in the pharynx in our study, and there also was no difference in perceived discomfort between the two groups. To conclude, uh, our findings indicate that Thrive is safe to use for pre-oxidation in rapid sequence induction in this setting. And we did, although we found no benefit in our primary outcome, we do think that uh, Fr Thrive may offer an advantage compared to the traditional face mask uh, 
shown in this study as a difference in numbers desaturating, numbers of patients desaturating below 93%. Thank you.